Welcome to the American Diabetes Association's 82nd Scientific Sessions. ADA TV is right here in New Orleans as the world's foremost experts in diabetes come together. From exclusive interviews with ADA leaders to fascinating topics in diabetes research to can't miss activities and sessions right here at the Ernest and Morial Convention Center. We're bringing you all the very best of this year's meeting. I'm your host, Nakondra Norwood, and you're watching ADA TV. with Donna DeBalia and she is our scientific sessions chair. Uh, you've worked on all of the wonderful things that we are learning about during this conference and there's some big stuff coming up today. You're going to be talking about the CERMOT 1 trial results. Tell us about that presentation. Indeed, we are very excited. Uh, this is a hot off the press uh, symposium uh, that um, is going to happen today at um, 8 a.m. sharp. Uh, the results of a new, um, much anticipated uh, phase three obesity trial with the new um, GLP, GIP1 receptor agonist or zepatide. Uh, this time um, being uh, explored as the new miracle drug to treat obesity, weight management. It's uh, perhaps as effective as gastric uh, bypass surgery. Uh, and uh, about uh, when we can start using it in clinical practice. Very exciting. Uh, tell us how important that is. I think this is a game changer in diabetes care as we are more and more uh, understanding that we need to focus our uh, treatments not only on controlling uh, uh, blood glucose, but also on controlling management, uh, managing obesity, as well as the other complications of diabetes. So definitely something that a lot of folks here are going to want to tune into, and I'm sure it's going to be, you know, well beyond those folks that are really scientifically interested Absolutely. here. Absolutely. I think this is one of the highlights of uh, this year's um, session. It's going to be live screen for those who are not able to attend in person. And of course, uh, attendees that are uh, joining virtually will be able to watch this virtually as well. And so we've got a couple of other big things going on today. What about the President for Healthcare and Education's address? As always, we have um, uh, today uh, the address uh, from our President for Healthcare and Education, Dr. Uh, Otis Kirksey. Uh, who's going to talk about uh, working with the diabetes community and um, that's immediately followed by the Outstanding, Outstanding Educator in Diabetes Award Lecture which uh, is given this year by uh, Amy uh, Hess-Fischel who is being recognized for, for outstanding educational efforts in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes and so what are some other Saturday, you know, can't miss things? At least for me, one of the important things that are happening Saturday is a symposium uh, that addresses the growing epidemic of diabetes. We're in a pandemic right now, so we know what that means, but we're also witnessing another more silent, perhaps, pandemic, because diabetes is a pandemic. So uh, addressing that, the symposium uh, today uh, is um, going to summarize the recent report to Congress of the National Clinical Care Commission, uh, and I think it's entitled A Transformative Approach to Prevention and Control of Diabetes in the United States. And so much going on at the, the, the entire conference here. Anything else you want to make sure we get on the calendar for Saturday? Another session uh, Saturday that, that I would invite uh, um, our uh, attendees to attend is uh, one uh, about uh, uh, novel clinical trials in type 1 diabetes. There, there are several uh, throughout the conference, but one on Saturday, Saturday afternoon. I uh, don't miss that session. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dana, for joining us. And we're going to have a lot more coming up for you from ADA TV. I've been attending ADS since 2006. I'm looking forward to learn so many new things in diabetes, mainly obesity, which is a hot topic right now, and lipids, which is again going to be a focus this time, and definitely Benting lecture on insulin. I'm looking forward to it, excited about it. It's great to be back at the face-to-face -face Diabetes Congress after the last couple of years. The, the networking, bumping into old colleagues, you just can't replicate that online. So I'm looking for the latest developments relevant to my patients in primary care. 
despite the pandemic and the challenges, so much has happened in the world of diabetes and CVRM. So that's what I'm looking to, to take away today. So I manage community wellness in a rural county in uh, Calvert County, Maryland, with a small community hospital, and we have a phenomenal diabetes program, but I have great concerns over the mental wellness of our diabetic patients. So I'm targeting sessions today that talks about the chronic fatigue that our um, diabetic patients tend to have with having a chronic illness, how overwhelming it was during the pandemic. And then the other thing is really we saw very much with COVID the disparities. So being a, a, a person who's in charge of trying to break down some of those uh, disparities and those walls for our diabetic patients in our community, I'm looking for all that information too. So ADA is the place to go for it. We're standing in the uh, American Diabetes Association membership lounge and this is the 10 year anniversary of it. We started here 10 years ago and basically it's a lounge that was created for members to come in and kind of sit down and digest what you, what you are learning at scientific sessions and being able to chat with your colleagues or meet even new people you know, or other members of the association. This year, actually, we are going to be having some interest group uh, networking meetings during the lunch hours, uh, and also maybe even in the afternoon. Please come by, bring a friend, one of your colleagues, have them become a member, and um, then they too can enjoy the membership lounge and all the benefits that are available to you as a member. Australia's TTRA's $20 million research center to focus on building a culture of collaboration and signaling a new approach to boosting the translation and commercialization of Australian research to do more to help people with cardiovascular disease and diabetes. In January of 2022, MTP Connect, the Australian Growth Centre for the Medical Technologies, Biotechnology and Pharmaceutical Sector, uh, established two new virtual research centres in Australia, one for diabetes complications and one for cardiovascular disease related complications. ACARDI brings together a diverse group of researchers, scientists, engineers across the country. Each of the 18 projects can ultimately be supported and will also train the next generation of clinicians, researchers, scientists to really also think about commercialisation as well. ASHRA stands for Australian Stroke and Heart Research Accelerator. It's a new virtual collaborative centre with the goal of creating a new sector-wide focus to how we translate cardiovascular science into improved cardiovascular outcomes with specific focus on coronary heart disease, heart failure and stroke. We look forward to the research centres building new partnerships and international collaborations and ultimately driving these extraordinary innovations from the bench to the bedside and producing real change for patients and their families. Welcome back. We are here to talk with Otis Kirksey. He is the president of healthcare and education for the ADA. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a quote here. Tell us what this quote means to you. People don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. That is, that, actually that was quote was from Theodore Roosevelt and actually is a quote I use particularly uh, when I was teaching before I retired because I wanted students to understand that well, you know, you have to first care before you can provide care, okay? Uh, and uh, I truly believe that you have to meet people where they are. And once you demonstrate that you care, then you get patient trust and they'll follow, right? But patient, uh, patients are very, very uh, smart and they can see right through the phoniness. And so I've always approached my encounters with my patients as if they were personal family members. So is that the why behind the work that you do? Oh, man, the why, there's a lot of whys. Uh, yes, having family members that were impacted by diabetes, uh, having a mother who taught for 40 years in Volusia County and talking about the advocacy and about being, uh, uh, having that thirst for, for learning and education, uh, having an um, uh, uncle who, uh, was a 300 pound gay man, right? But we wasn't the strongest man I, I, I knew. He suffered from diabetes. And you know, he said, hey, high expectations and took no um, uh, excuses for failure. You know, so uh, I had a 
great village that, that supported me. Truly believe you cannot get anywhere without any help, right? And so I've always tried to dedicate my professional life, my personal life, to paying it forward because I had instrumental people in my life to help guide me and mold me into the individual I am now. So yeah, a, a, a broad scope of, you know, that village pushing you along. Oh, sure, sure, and they're still pushing me. You know, I have my village here today supporting me. And, uh, you know, it's important that you surround yourself with people that are gonna motivate you, encourage you to continue doing it. I don't think we ever stop giving in terms of charitable giving and so forth. We all should have a purpose, right? And so I think that, that that is lifelong. It doesn't stop, you know. So what are your hopes for the future for ADA's healthcare and education? Uh, you know, so I'm hoping that we can expand our Health Equity Now uh, platform, bring more people under the tent. I'm hoping that we can expand our professional membership to bring in more uh, diabetes care and education specialists, to bring in more community diabetes uh, 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 educators and so forth, because look, Right now, we have 37 million people that live with diabetes. We have 96 million with pre-diabetes, right? What do you think the rate is going to, of diabetes is going to be in 2050? We don't have right now, with our educator capacity, one provider per 16,000 patients. That's not going to work, right? So we need all hands on deck. And in order to do that, we need to bring more people under the, uh, under the tent, mm -hmm. right? Because collectively, you know, we can begin to make some change and bend the curve on diabetes. Well, thank you so much, Otis. You know, we're, yeah, it sounds like a big charge from you there to everyone here <laughs> at ADA. Maybe bring along a friend to help bridge that gap. We'll have more coming up. Thanks again for joining us, Otis. Recording blood glucose levels and diet on pen and paper can be so stressful at times and time consuming for pregnant women with gestational diabetes. However, a new app called A Mother from the Australian eHealth Research Center is here to change the way we approach GDM treatment and care. I'm Stephanie, I'm 32 weeks pregnant and I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes when I was five weeks. Gestational diabetes is the commonest medical disorder affecting pregnancy and in Australia affects approximately one in eight women during the time of their maternity. I have to keep control of my blood sugar, otherwise my baby could grow too big. On top of the added kind of things I'm thinking about being pregnant, I also have to think about monitoring my sugars and recording them so that I can show them to the medical people. The Mother platform is an mHealth platform to support the management of gestational diabetes. We use a person-facing app and a web-based platform for clinicians. The app links with a Bluetooth glucometer, so the app talks to the web-based platform, and then clinicians can review those blood sugars remotely. They can therefore make decisions on the care for the women, and in many cases they can intervene quickly if there are um, issues or risks for the women with blood glucose levels that are out of control. Next, we'll take a look at the insulin-only bionic pancreas pivotal trial. Stephen J. Russell will share results from the randomized clinical trial and what they could mean for the efficacy of the islet bionic pancreas system. The IOBPT is the insulin-only bionic pancreas trial. It's a pivotal trial. And it was a, a recently completed study that uh, 16 sites in the United States did to test a new insulin delivery device, a new automated insulin delivery device. And it's a large trial that's designed to provide the FDA the data they need to be able to evaluate whether it could be cleared for sale. It was the first trial, I believe, that included both adults and kids in the same trial. The trial enrolled uh, participants from age six on up. It also uh, was the first trial to have hemoglobin A1C as the primary outcome of the study and then had a number of secondary outcomes as well. And that's important because the FDA regards that as 
the, the gold standard metric for uh, approving clinical efficacy of, of diabetes interventions. It's a little different than other automated insulin delivery devices. Uh, for one thing, it is started differently. A normal uh, hybrid closed loop device would require that you put in an insulin delivery regimen, you know, a, either a basal rate or a total daily dose, usually a carb to insulin ratio, sensitivity factor, some combination of those. This system doesn't require that at all. You just enter the weight of the patient, that gives it an initial idea of the dose scaling, and then it adapts continuously um, and autonomously to find the right insulin dosing for that uh, patient to meet their insulin needs. It doesn't require carbohydrate counting, so when people uh, announce a meal to the device, they just say whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and whether it's a usual size for them, more or less. And the system learns over time what they mean by that and how much insulin is needed, and it tries to give about 75% of the insulin that's needed for that meal. Another way it's different is that the device determines all of the insulin delivered autonomously. It's not possible for the person to determine the size of an insulin dose. So they enter the, the meal size in that qualitative way, the device decides how much insulin to give. All of the correction insulin is given automatically. All the basal is automatically regulated by the device. So literally every single dose of insulin that's given is entirely determined by the device. The trial has been completed now. It was unique in that it was quite a large trial, so there were 440 participants who participated over three months in the randomized part of the study. And the primary outcome was hemoglobin A1C. And we found that the hemoglobin A1C was reduced by an average of 0.5% across the board. And it turned out that when we looked at the subgroups in children and adults that were pre-specified for analysis, they each had about a half a percent reduction in hemoglobin A1C. The key secondary outcome was time less than 54 milligrams per deciliter or level two hypoglycemia. And we found that there was no change in the hypoglycemia compared to the standard of care group. It's, as far as I know, the only system like this that doesn't have a manual mode, which is what you would normally transition to if you were using a hybrid closed loop system. Now, let's head to Mississippi where Vigilant Health is working to deliver equitable and accessible diabetes care to rural populations at a low cost. We have an immense amount of literature and studies that define what we ought to do in diabetes. There's very little real world experience of actually achieving those things. And so we built a system of care for diabetes in Mississippi, care for inner city populations and rural populations. The Vigilant model works because it understands why the systems we have in place didn't work before. And when we educate the patient as to the what and why of their chronic disease, Disease, we get behavioral changes that create outcomes. They are able to make these claims in populations that are much more diverse with regard to socioeconomics. Vigilant really has demonstrated the ability to change A1C in a sustainable way. The ultimate goal in Vigilant is to create educated patients that are better advocates for their own health and they have control of their destiny, if you will. At the University of Miami, scientists have been making new discoveries related to lipotoxicity and its role in kidney disease and its progression. That research has led to a partnership with Cyversa Therapeutics, who is preparing to initiate patient studies with a therapy targeting renal cholesterol accumulation. I've been working diabetic kidney disease for many, many years, and I've never been a lipid expert. But uh, science is beautiful because it reveals new knowledge as you go. When you look at the exploration of renal diseases, Dr. Pannoni and her team had really done some innovative work. We were able to discover that it is the cholesterol that accumulates in the kidneys of patients that eventually cause the progression to the need for dialysis. 
And right now we are really strongly supporting the idea that extracting this cholesterol with several agents, including hydroxypropyl beta cyclodestrin, could actually rescue them from kidney disease progression. And so we were very fortunate to work with a startup company, Diversa Therapeutics, to be able to bring this now in trial is the greatest satisfaction I can possibly have. My name is Amy Hesfischel, and I am the 2022 recipient for Outstanding Educator of the Year. My main inspiration for becoming an advocate for people with diabetes was just working with them. You know, I needed a master's thesis, and that was really the reason that I became a diabetes care and education specialist. And working with individuals and their families regarding their diabetes self-management has been so rewarding. And I want them to succeed. I want to help them in any way I can. So if I can advocate and keep advocating to do what they need to do to live their lives is what I want to do. Diabetes self-management education and support is the crux of diabetes care. We know that individuals with diabetes need to know what they need to do. They need to know what's going to be best for them. and. DSMES, Diabetes Self-Management Education and Support, does that on an ongoing basis. So we know that the four critical times for DSMES is at diagnosis, annually, if complicating factors arise, and transitions in care. So again, we want to make sure that these people are getting at the, those four critical times because again, everything changes and making sure that they have that lube in a tune, they have information on an ongoing basis is going to make them happier selves. I think endocrinologists as well as other specialists and uh, primary care physicians and other nurse practitioners and, and uh, physician assistants should be collaborating with certified diabetes care and education specialists because it makes their jobs easier. Having that collaboration is going to help them to focus on the things they need and let us kind of pick up some of that slack for them. But again, it is a collaboration. We're not taking anything away from anyone. It's again, it's that really working together for that person with diabetes. Well, that's it for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more. So make sure to check in for more exciting content on TV screens around the convention center. In select hotels, on hotel shuttle buses, on the Scientific Sessions website, and on YouTube and Twitter. Be sure to check out the ADA TV newsletter by scanning the code on your screen. Tomorrow, we'll hear more results from clinical trials with Surmount One, talk to outstanding scientific award winner Anna Gloin, and see top research from ADA early career members, and so much more. You won't want to miss it, so be sure to tune in. See you there.